Okay, welcome back for another episode of Porn Brain Reboot with me, your hostess, Dr. Trish Lee. Um, My job here in this podcast is to not only motivate you and inspire you to leave pornography behind, but most importantly, to empower you through coaching tips and tools so that you have action steps to be able to do so. And today I am very excited to have a guest with us, Havard Mila. Mella, I said it wrong, Havard, Havard (laughs) Mella, um, who will be joining us. He's an author of a really awesome book, How to Thrive in the 21st Century by Avoiding Porn and Other Distractions, A Guide to Life in the Information Age. And I know so many people when they begin to understand that they're struggling with pornography, the first thing that they do is look for a book. And if you're looking for a book and you are looking for information, not only on somebody else's story to inspire you, but also to give you really concrete action steps, this is an amazing book for you. So I would really recommend you go get this book right away. But today on the podcast, what we're going to do is highlight some of the strongest points, I think, um, and have Havard kind of walk us through some of his journey and what led him to write the book, and then have some takeaways for you. So I welcome you, Havard. (laughs) Yeah, thanks. I'm I'm really excited to be here today, and I really look forward to to the podcast. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate you joining me because, you know, I know that as a cognitive neuroscientist and a certified sex addiction recovery coach, you know, I have a lot to offer people, and I'm glad to be able to, to play that role, the role that you can help uh, with people understand and, um, you know, really help people in their journeys is through your book, having an inspiring story of recovery and kind of the understanding that you developed along the way. So I'm really excited for you to be able to offer that to people because I know a lot of people want to be able to hear from someone who has succeeded at this journey because it is so challenging. Um, and, you know, know that there's not only hope, but there's action steps. Uh, and so I'll lead in with that if you don't mind sharing your story a little bit and what inspired you as you were moving through this journey to put it into a book. Yeah, so uh, I guess I kind of have the same story as a lot of other people that uh, embark on this journey and so I started to like experience a few issues with um, social anxiety uh, struggled with motivation and yeah like uh, the the common problems people report like at first I, I didn't really understand why this was happening so I started doing research and eventually like I started to trace it back to and realizing it it might be due to to watching porn yeah uh thank you for kind of putting it that way because i part of the reason that i uh, started making youtube videos and started getting content out there is because I know so many people are in the same position that you just talked about where, you know, you start struggling with different issues, anxiety, erectile dysfunction, depression, moodiness, relationships start getting, you know, distressed in terms of dynamics. And it's very difficult to trace that back to pornography use. The link between the two is not easy to see at first until you dig into the research. Sometimes when you start digging into the research, what you find is online and, you know, I encourage everybody not to believe everything on the internet because you'll find that there'll be websites that say porn's good for you and, you know, masturbation's no yeah. big deal. So um, do you, can you add to that at all? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I found like yeah, a few really good uh, websites that really helped me out because they, they actually said that this can actually be a, an issue because a lot of mainstream articles that I stumbled upon at first, they kind of said, like like you said, that watching porn is completely normal, it's healthy, etc. And for some people, it can, it can be really, really damaging. So, and that's also why I felt the need or that I wanted to, to write this book is because on my journey, 
I found like a few key insights that I believe can be really helpful for somebody that tries to, to overcome this uh, issue. Yeah, thanks. And uh, let's lead into one of those key insights. And if it's okay, we can start with the idea of restricting or balancing digital use. And I know that's something that's important to you. Um, we've talked before and you're writing a second follow-up book that focuses more on how to restrict or to balance digital use. Um, I'd love for you to share some of your findings and, and some of your experience with that would be great. Yeah, yeah, so um, I, I guess a lot of people here have heard about uh, supernormal stimuli, which is basically uh, some examples would be like just surfing the internet or, or watching porn, uh, because uh, these things potentially activate the reward system and they, they kind of take advantage of our need to explore. So we're actually building new neural pathways that weaken our uh, original, like evolutionarily developed pathways. And uh, yeah, this it basically desensitizes us to life if we follow these pathways too much. So I would say like anything that's like passive usage of the internet is like in moderation, it's okay, but we, we should be really, try to be more proactive because these days the norm is to like spend hours every day just consuming content and and it has side effects there's uh, no doubt about it yeah i love the way that you put that uh passive i don't talk about it that way so that's an interesting um concept uh, you'll probably hear me talk about it that way in the future in terms of like passive consumption of content versus active consumption where you actively go to the internet for uh, research or to figure something out. The way I talk about it is intention. I talk about intention and purpose a lot. So like uh, using okay. using things intentionally, using anything inten intentionally, like even just being intentional in your relationships, being intentional in your work, because, and I love this idea that you've just presented that you can be passive in your work too, like sit down for the day, like, okay, what's coming at me? What do I deal with? That's a very passive approach to working. Same thing in a relationship. Like I joke, I have five children, mostly teenagers. You know, my kids will be like, can we go do whatever? Not so much these days, but, and if my husband and I have plans, I'll be like, you know, I'm, I'm relationship building because I'm intentional about our relationship too. Like I don't take for granted that it's going to be fantastic for the rest of our lives. You have to work on that. Same thing. You know, I'm always talking about work relationships and hobbies, but I love that in terms of digital use. It's passive. You're just sitting there scrolling and seeing what comes at you versus being intentional about it. And uh, I don't know if you're willing to speak to maybe some strategies that you personally developed around that so that you could go from passive to active or restricting it, um, kind of being intentional or, or did you have to leave it behind for a while? Yeah, so uh, mostly I just, um, I started um, like taking a, um, starting to be more conscious with uh, how I planned my days. So like yeah, from 10 p.m. before bedtime, I, I stopped using my phone. And also I, I made sure to have some, um, some hours in the start of the day where I could work uh, uninterrupted. And doing that for a period of time just enabled me to, to be more proactive in general. So nowadays I don't really have any rules that I follow, but I try to be like more conscious with the use because like the internet is a fantastic resource. And if we use it in the right way, it's mass, it's like, it's the most incredible resource out there. I, I know, it's it, amazing, right? <laughs> Yeah, but if you use it passively, the it, it comes with a lot of side effects. Oh, so, yes, it does. But I would say like perhaps the, the most important thing is to just um, gain a stronger self-control. And, and this is something we can do by, by making challenges to ourselves in our daily lives. And every time 
we do something that's a bit difficult, we become stronger. So it's kind of like a muscle. Definitely. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I know it's so funny because I know uh, from reading in your book that you have gone to college and earned a degree. Um, and my point about that is when I was back in college doing my, I have two PhDs, but when I was, was in grad school, I spent all my time in the library because there, you know, not to date myself, the internet was a new thing. I remember when I went back from mm graduate school to my doctorate program, they made me get an email. And I'm like, I don't think I need this email thing because I couldn't handle it. It was difficult to use back then too. I'm like, no, thank you on the email. <laughs> and like, I, I resisted the email like so many people, but you know, now you can go online and have fake news and real news presented to you and you can spend hours and hours and hours. And, you know, it really is a gift to be able to, especially for people who know what it used to be like to hold themselves up in a library for an entire life, you know, day, years, um, but really having discernment yeah. and, and a way I talk about it too is what, which you've touched upon, but kind of the way that I think about it is structure and discipline. And I know you talk about willpower a lot in the book too. I think willpower comes from what you've just spoken to is structure and discipline. And I offer a 90 day program. I think you know that for people to recover from poor news, but the um, flexibly structured life is at the core of it so that you have structure, but you don't feel overly structured. And a morning routine is essential for people who haven't. And I think that would be a great takeaway for people listening today, that if you don't have a morning routine and you don't start your day by consuming something positive, I read a, a little bit of a book every morning that sets the tone for where my brain and my mind is going to go for the day in terms of helping people in uh, staying positive, positive psychology, mindfulness. Um, but I'm really intentional about how I start my day and I'm intentional on how it's structured, you know, leaving technology behind at 10 p.m. And it, it becomes kind of like an unwritten rule to live by, but it can really ground you in an amazing lifestyle if you can build that and that becomes really important. Um, if it's OK, if we can kind of shift gears a little bit, because I want to make sure I get to at least this topic, because I know it's a really important one to many people, is talking about relapses. And if I would love for you to talk about what helped you in terms of relapse. And one thing you wrote in your book is that talking about the concept of people relapsing due to, and I put quote unquote, perceived setbacks. So the idea of perceived setbacks leading to relapse, and then what helped you to avoid that or to overcome it yeah yeah so i think um like um, most of the time um when people relapse trying to avoid porn it's mostly because they, they get into a, a negative emotional state due to some sort of perceived setback in their lives like whatever negative that happens it's really easy to let it affect you and um when that happens, it's it's really uh, diff um, it can be difficult to to keep track of uh, why you're doing it or why you're trying to to avoid uh, porn. So I, I think the main key here is to just be really like ha have clear goals for what you want to accomplish, and not only with with avoiding porn but also in life, and trying to remind yourself of those goals. And um, I think that can help with um, help with uh, getting out of those unresol unresourceful emotional states. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And thinking about time and kind of a framework shift around time, because I know when people approach recovery, many people will say to me, like, I don't think I can do this because I don't think I can leave porn behind for the whole rest of my life. And I'll say like, you, let's just worry about this evening. And, you know, having that framework shift of that, those perceived setbacks and that negative emotional states can trigger people into relapses. Then they feel overwhelmed. Like, how am I going to do this for the whole rest of my life? And you talking about goals, yeah. long-term goals versus, you know, long-term gain 
short-term loss can be a really powerful, um, even just concept for a person to realize. And it leads me into another um, quote that you have in your book about daily micro decisions. And I love the way you put it. And it's micro, micro decisions every single day until you're dead. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I love that because yeah. What an awesome concept. So if you could speak to the micro decisions and I love, you know, that you don't get to do yeah. it today, tomorrow until you're dead and that will build a beautiful life. So if you could speak to that, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so I actually think yeah, the micro decisions we do and, and what I mean about a micro decision is like the tiny decisions we make all the time. Like, should I continue reading or should I take a quick break? Like, why not wait two minutes? Like, I actually believe it's in those small, tiny decisions. That is where, like, success is reached or not. Like, how hard are we actually able to be with ourselves in those small moments when nobody is watching? And it's also, like, perhaps the best way to actually build discipline, willpower, is to just set a goal, like, for instance, I'm going to read for one hour, regardless of what I feel like after the 30 minutes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, yeah, you, you get really like disciplined really fast. And if you keep this up, like compound interest is going to make sure your life gets a lot better. Yeah, I love that compound interest. It builds every micro decision builds upon the last one and leads to the next one and thousands of them. And that's a really important concept for me to highlight because People think they have to make these giant decisions and that those giant decisions are too hard to make and that they can't do it. And actually, I was thinking about you this morning. It's early for me um, right now recording this. And like I said, I have a morning routine. I It's beautiful out today. It's, it's, very, it's actually been so hot in North Carolina where I live. It's, and it's been so humid. You can't even sit outside or you feel like you're going to combust. Today, it's 63 and it's cool. And, you know, I'm sitting on my back porch doing my morning routine and, you know, obviously I wanted to stay there for like another hour because it was this cool, lovely day. And I was thinking about the micro decision. I, I did my meditation. I was reading and kind of organizing my mind. And then I looked at the clock and I was going to stay for a while. And then I thought to myself, this is a micro decision. Even if I stay for 10 more minutes, I'm going to be late, which means I'm going to be Run yeah. and my office is on the top floor. I'm going to be running around to set everything up. I'm going to be all flustered. And so I stopped that morning routine at the time I was supposed to instead of pushing the limits. And so that I was able to get organized and feel comfortable and relaxed when we started. And that's just one tiny decision. It's the matter of 10 minutes. You would think it wouldn't be a big deal, but it has the snowball effect. And I like the way you put it yeah. in the book too, is that like food is micro decisions. Fitness is micro decisions. You know, do I, do I go for a walk? It doesn't seem like that would have a big impact, but if you, even if you go for a walk on Tuesday and you've moved your body a little, now you go for a walk on Wednesday and before you know it, you're the person who goes for walks or goes for runs or works out. So I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah it's, it's so easy to, to like believe that it's like one massive decision that changes your life. But it's actually those like really, really tiny decisions that affect your life long term. It's like those small decisions when you're all, all by yourself and you're free to do whatever, nobody's watching. Those yep. are the moments that will determine who you become long term. Yeah, I love that. And when you set goals, you know, you talked about goals a little bit. When you set your sights on who you want to become. And I know that people struggle with creating the vision of themselves you have to envision the next version of yourself or you can't strive to be that version. And you talked about that in your book that, you know, you were, you had social anxiety, you were living with your parents and spending a lot of time doing nothing, but you could envision yourself going to school and then getting on purpose and work. And when you set that vision for yourself, it anchors you into the long-term goal. So you can, make those micro decisions. So I think setting a goal for yourself is really, really important. And when people comment on my YouTube channel, it's really interesting because this happens a lot where people say, okay, boys, I'm going for it. Wish me luck. Yeah. And I comment back, change something, 
change as many things about your life that you can, you know, of course, like, you know, it's just a quick comment and there's hundreds of videos there on what changes could be made, but, you know, you can't just make this big decision on a Tuesday morning, like I'm going to do this. And it has to be the small decisions when you're alone, when it's either you go towards it or you go towards the version of yourself that you want to become. So I really, I really love that. Yeah. Um, kind of just moving forward uh, a little bit on thinking about recovery. And, you know, I know recovery is a big word too. I try not to use a lot of words that feel overwhelming to people, but thinking about the framework shift that was most important to you. And if you, if you have some kind of guidepost for, for doing that from shifting from where you were in life to where you wanted to go. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say perhaps the most important thing for me uh, was expanding the, the time horizon, like on what I perceived as important, because I, I used to be a person that cared mostly about like what happens this week or that like maximum, like one month ahead, perhaps. And mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if that's the case, then it's going to be almost impossible to, to, to change in a meaningful way because when we decide to change it's going to be uncomfortable up front so in order to actually go through those difficult moments that can arise in the beginning we need to have this vision of where we want to go so you kind of have to force yourself to think maybe two three or five years ahead and when you actually start to consider that person like who do i want to be in five years and you kind of ingrain this in your brain, it becomes a lot more effortless to have um, good habits. And, and one like key difficulty with this is that we, we humans have this irrational bias towards right now. So many people would prefer to have like $50 today than $100 one year from now. And like this tendency, yeah, it's a psychological bias, but we can kind of circumvent it if if we think about it and and try to like envision ourselves in the future. And I think that's perhaps the most important thing to yeah to change in in a meaningful way. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. That's uh, that's really really powerful, and I really appreciate you sharing it. Um, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you would like to share that you think I haven't highlighted from your book? I really loved your book. I really did. That's why I reached out to Havard because I'm like, people need to know this book exists. And when you go to Amazon, it's available on Amazon. When you go there and you're looking for something to help you, this is an awesome resource. The way that you organized it and just to share it with people. I love the organization because it is enough to think about and to unpack. And then you give people a break. And I don't know if you did this intentionally. And I, I think, especially for people who struggle with pornography use uh, that, you know, giving them something to think about an action step to be able to move forward. And then a break in terms of the way it's organized is really beautiful because I think it is a recipe for success where a lot of books are organized with a ton of content. And then, you know, you have to make your way through a lot of it to be able to make heads or tails so I really appreciate the way you put that together, whether it was intentional for the, for the reader or not. Um, but is there anything yeah, else that, thanks. yeah, it's great. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to share that I haven't highlighted? Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I think actually like the concept of, of pain is really important because like, I, I think a lot of issues uh, come from that we we try to avoid pain because like I, I would say like basically all of us have an aversion to choose doing painful stuff proactively like for instance if you have never worked out and you want to like go to the gym there's going to be a, a month or so where it's really uncomfortable but if you just barrel through that initial month your life is going to be much better so I think like it, it's the same stuff with um, with avoiding porn. Like if you decide to quit, maybe there is a month or max two months where it's some uncomfortable moments. But if you just barrel through, your life is going to have less pain overall. The only difference is you have to kind of 
take it upon yourself proactively. Yeah, I love that. And I talk about it, which actually I borrowed from Jillian Michaels because I use the Jillian Michaels app to work out. And in the workouts, she's always talking about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I love that. And it's, it totally motivates me when I'm working out and to be able to kind of like push through the last you know, reps of something when I just don't want to, and I feel like I can't, but when you get comfortable with being uncomfortable, you can push through that discomfort, knowing that it only lasts for a small amount of time, relatively speaking, it, it might feel like an eternity when you're doing it, but it's relatively, yeah. it's a short amount of time. And if you push through it, the gain is there. And, you know, thinking about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, because also, like you said earlier, that's building the muscle for discomfort. And I talk about this in my videos all the time, is that we know from the science that when people establish a pornography habit, uh, I, I don't know if you saw this, I just made a video on it, where science shows the number one, pe the one, number one reason that people go to porn is to regulate negative emotions, to take the edge off of of discomfort yeah. of their feelings. So we know this. So you talking about figuring out a way to barrel through that discomfort and at first self-awareness, like becoming aware of what is the discomfort? Some of it's going to be just withdrawal from not going back for that dopamine hit, but other aspects of it is going to be the underlying discomfort that led you there in the first place. That's why those micro decisions yeah. and changes can be so important yeah yeah i actually believe like a lot of uh, at least for me personally a lot of uh, overcoming this addiction was just developing a higher pain threshold and uh yeah because when you decide to quit like for me as well there was some like really difficult emotional moments mm -hmm. and i needed to to be strong to handle those uh, those moments and by having a disciplined lifestyle, like working out, taking cold showers, going for the difficult micro decisions, doing those kind of things enabled me to, to get through it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I, I dusted off my, um, book, the power of now by Eckhart Tolle. I'm sure you probably at least heard of it. And in yeah. there I dusted off and I've been reading just a page or two, like I talked about earlier each day. And I was just reading the part on what he calls the pain body. And he talks about how we get stuck in our pain body and then we, and this is definitely true um, scientifically when it comes to porn use is that we get stuck in this pain body and it becomes all we know in a certain sense, but it's difficult for us to leave it behind because when you continue to go back to porn, you're actually creating a lot of the pain for yourself. And, you know, this goes back to what we talked about that you can't trace a lot of your health issues or your emotional state issues to porn use because it perpetuates anxiety. It gives you a lot of physical symptoms. And the essence mm -hmm. of the pain body is it feeds itself where you have to be able to go through the discomfort of leaving it behind and, you know, kind of like a Phoenix renewing yourself. But that process is a painful one. But just like you talked about, if you can in embrace that process and kind of go through perceived more pain, you end up with less pain yeah. in the end because you break the cycle. And so pain's yeah, a great, yeah, exactly. you know, pain's a great thing to talk about because people don't understand they're caught in pain. And, you know, people tell me this all the time too. And it's the way I think about it, that porn use is really self-sabotage. It creates a shame cycle. It gives you these feelings that you need then to escape from. So it gives you the escape for a little while. And like you talked about before, it desensitizes you to the joy of life and it's sensitizing your neural networks to only pleasure seeking in, I always call it the easy button, which obviously I borrowed from Staples, <laughs> but the easy <laughs> button of, you know, getting the reward without doing the work. So then when you go into your life, you don't want to do the work of being intentional in your, in your job, because that requires a lot of effort or being intentional yeah. in your relationships. So pain definitely kind of, you know, moving through that discomfort. Um, and do you, how, what do you think help, helped you do that to kind of like crash through the discomfort micro decisions? Uh, I would say mostly that I started to, to really account for my future. I started to care about my future and I kind of realized 
that I had to go through these difficult moments. And I, I, I just came to terms with it. Like there's going to be a pain no matter, matter what. I might just as well, I might just as well uh, like get over with this and, and, and basically start my life in a, yeah, that was how it felt like for me. Yeah. And what do you think the best thing that's come from it? You know, what, what do you think a, an outcome for people that when they decide to avoid porn and leave it behind, like what's been kind of the rainbow for you? Yeah. So I, I would say like now it's a lot easier for me to connect with people. That's perhaps the, the biggest one because my my neural pathways are more sensitized. I'm able to, to experience real joy. And I also like in terms of becoming successful, overcoming this addiction is, is fantastic because you build great discipline, you build willpower, you build the ability to delay rewards. So if you actually manage to overcome this, you will be in a fantastic position to to go by default when you overcome it, you will build great foundations for success. So yeah, uh, I love that. Really, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I in the program that I created, I always tell people it's an optimal performance program. You know, and and we think of peak performance. Peak performers are like you know, right now the Olympics are going on. Someone who can do a hundred yard dash for you know a few for a minute or whatever that's a peak performance you're doing it one minute of your life of course you're training a lot for it optimal performance is what you're talking about creating this structure infrastructure i was talking about that yesterday that you know i'm building this infrastructure right now for the nonprofit that i'm establishing because it needs to have a strong infrastructure if i'm going to make this thing successful over time and you know you have to build the infrastructure of your life which is what you're talking about. And it's an optimal performance life where if you can learn these strategies and you put them together, there's literally no way you can't succeed at what you're trying to create for yourself because you know what that is. First of all, you've established yeah. those goals, you know what you're shooting for. And then secondly, you've put together how you're going to get there and achieve the goals. And then, you know, I always talk about how every seven years, our entire bodies and brains are different, our cells, our hair our thought processes. Seven years is basically, you know, the human body regenerates itself. And my life has existed in seven year chapters, you know, and I'm on what hmm. I must be on chapter, almost chapter eight or no, seven, <laughs> but uh, which is kind of a cool thing because that's evolution. So like when you set that goal from five years from now and you achieve that five years from now, there's new goals. To, to be set. It's not like you're done. And that's the whole micro decisions until you're dead is that you continue to evolve, yeah. but you've put the infrastructure in place so that it feels good to evolve. And that's why I tell people in the program that the hardest part is getting in and getting started because once you build this infrastructure, it becomes fun and engaging. Uh, so thank you for sharing that because I think that's a really awesome outcome that, you know, success but not only like success as it's perceived in the world, just knowing that you now have the tools to always move forward, that you've developed those tools yourself yeah. and you have them to move forward. That's a beautiful gift that you've given yourself. Uh, and that's what I want for everybody out there who's listening, that you can give yourself those gifts also and create that for yourself and, you know, be that person who can't be stopped from here on out. So, um, any last thoughts before we hmm. wrap up? Yeah, uh, I would like to add that, like, even like still for me, uh, I, I still need to, it's not like you, if you do like really good micro decisions or do really difficult stuff for mon one month that you can like relax for the rest of your life. That's not how it works, but you can kind of build the infrastructure and then it, it gets easier to maintain the good habits you have. So yeah, it's, it's not like uh, there's one difficult month and then everything is set. But if you accept the, the one, one or two months uh, up front, then you will have great foundations in place for, yeah, for the rest of your life. 
Yeah. And I, I think of that as vigilance because again, people ask me this all the time. Like, am I going to have to avoid porn for the rest of my life? And maybe you can speak to this, but I'll tell you what I tell people is that if you can create this infrastructure, it's not like you have to be hyper vigilant where you're always thinking about avoiding porn. What you have to do is create the infrastructure, but then be vigilant to keep your infrastructure in place. So don't let your discipline, don't let the the structure that you've put, don't stop doing your morning meditation. Don't stop reading. Don't start bringing your phone to bed again. You stay vigilant against, against letting your routines break down. Because if you create this lifestyle, this flex flexibly scheduled and structured lifestyle, that is what will make it so that it'll be the rare moments. If you have them where you have to you know, worry about relapse and worry about pushing through discomfort again. It's that infrastructure that's important. Keep that infrastructure in place. Don't let it break down. What's your experience with that? Yeah. Yeah, I I totally, totally agree with that. I think of it like nowadays my willpower struggles, they revolve around bigger problems. Mm -hmm. So it's more kind of like when I have... uh, Maybe my struggles is more like how much am, am I able to read now? Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, it's more like yeah, just following the habits. And uh, yeah, it's it's very, very seldom that I have to think about uh, avoiding it like proactively. Yeah, that's great. And that's evolution. That's what we're talking about, right? It, it, like your struggles are how you're going to get to the next level. And that's how it should be evolution. That's a great thing. Well, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And I hope everybody goes and buys your book because I think it, especially uh, if someone's listening and hasn't started this journey of trying to figure out how to leave porn behind, it's a great first or last resource. So I appreciate you writing it because I know that takes courage and strength and uh, especially being here today and talking with me about it. I am very grateful to have you. Um, okay, so thank you, Havard, for coming. And I'm just going to wrap up and remind everybody that um, if you're looking for help on this journey, I'm creating a nonprofit. We're going to have a lot of resources for you for free. And in the meantime, you can jump on over to my website at drtrishley.com. I would love to uh, be able to help you if you need help. And as always, control your brain or it will control you. Thanks, Havard. Appreciate it.